We have a amazing, amazing guest. I'm so thrilled. I was just telling my friends Joseph and Monique off camera, like, I've been reading about this topic. Philip, as we know, who runs Monsieur Day, sent this information to me. And they have a book coming out, Guadalupe and the Flower World Prophecy. I believe it's not out yet, correct? November 21st. November 21st. Right around the corner, everybody. And it's, I've been reading up on it online and I'm, I, I wanted to order because I, I, I thought the link that came to me, I was like, oh, it looks like I can order the book that I was kind of tapping online. I was like, dang it. Really it's, it's, coming. it's coming. It's coming. And I am it's coming. It's in pre-order now. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. I will put the pre-order link in the video here at the, at the bottom. So please, everybody check it out. And while you're, while I'm saying that, of course, please subscribe our we're growing nicely over here. We want to continue to bring you nice videos, great guests like this. Um, yeah, so our guests today, Joseph and Monique Gonzalez. So I nice. As I was saying off camera, you look so nice. But I did wear this shirt only because Padre Pio's feast day. So if anybody's oh, like, yeah. Padre Pio. Hey. Oh, Pio. <laughs> oh, Pio. I love it. So, um, <laughs> There is so much to talk about, and I want to get into as much as possible. First thing I want to ask you is, well, you're you're both musicians. Okay, I can start there, then I'll lead into a couple of things. Uh, Joseph, as you were telling me, were you writing music for some of the Guadalupe event or some of the poetry that was uh, mixed around the Aztecs? I mean, can you explain it to me? What 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 got you involved into the Guadalupe? Flower, flower world prophecy. Well, um, I really stumbled into it completely uh, about thirty years ago. Um, I'm a I'm a professional composer. I primarily write underscore for feature films, TV shows, movies, but I also write concert music. You know, music for symphony orchestras, for choirs, for chamber groups, string quartets, etc. And I was I was literally just inspired one time as I was driving through um, from L.A. to the Central Valley, where I got this idea to write an oratorio, which eventually turned into a concert mass, not a not a liturgical mass, concert. but a concert mass called Misa Azteca. So the idea was actually to blend um, Aztec rhythms, music and text with the Latin mass to really show metaphorically the blending of uh, cultures that occurred with, after the uh, after the Spanish met the uh, the indigenous. So with that idea, I had to get into this area called Aztec poetry. For some reason, I knew something like that existed. And it eventually led me to um, it eventually led me to this one song poem called the Cuica Pecayot, which translates into the origin of the songs. Now, this caused me a lot of problems. I was I was born and raised Catholic. Um, my grandma's name is Guadalupe. I went to Our Lady of Guadalupe Elementary School. So Guadalupe was all over the place. But what the, the, the problem that this poem came about, uh, had is that it sounds exactly like the Guadalupe song. Uh, we'll get into that, not the Guadalupe story. Um, and um, it really hurt my faith. And it, it, it brought me into this whole world of academic scholarship, which basically said that the, the, this text is, was the foundation for a made up or fabricated, fabricated Guadalupe story. So it really, this was in the early 1990s, but everything changed in 2009 when I met my wife here, Monique, and she mm -hmm. could introduce herself. And Well, just tag teaming. Basically, my background is I'm from Los Angeles. I've always sung, but I studied classical voice in L.A. and New York City. When I was living in Michigan, I was working with some Catholic apostolates, decided to come back to L.A., wanted to work with a composer. I've always loved film and TV scores, wanted to become a composer's assistant, met Joseph my very first day back, and uh, he hired me pretty quickly. And within right at that exact time is Carnegie Hall wanted to do Misa Azteca for the second time. 
And he wanted to add a couple of movements. And that's when he handed me these song poems and said, hey, can you help me find a couple of uh, song poems? I could create two two or or three that's new movements. movements to so, it. so of course, I get into it. I've opened, might as well start at the beginning. Kwika Pekayot is the name of this ancient song poem. I read it and went, what? This yeah. sounds like a Guadalupe story. And then when, of course, when I, I still remember this as clear as day, he comes into the studio. I'm like, did you realize that this first poem sounds like Guadalupe? He's like, yeah, flip to the back of the book and see what the author says. The translator. And, the translator. And he, and he says very clearly, this must be the basis for a fabricated Guadalupe narrative. And at that point, we were like, okay, we got to figure this out because for different reasons, Guadalupe was important. And we decided to start this quest to find out what is going on. Right. We, we kind of vowed. Um, we, we said vowed. we're going to get as many books as we can, you know, get our hands on. Uh, we ended up looking at many, many PhD dissertations, master's mm -hmm. thesis, et cetera. We ended up going to conferences, Mesoamerican yes. conferences, where we actually met a lot of these people. The we experts. would have lunch with them. We actually filmed some of them. We got them on camera talking about their various uh, theories about what was going on. But just to kind of give a kind of a little bit of a thumbnail, Monique, what why what is this song poem about the Cuica Pecayot? Well, the Cuica Pecayot is again is about a singer who's looking for holy sacred flowers to gather in his tilma so that he can go down the hill and share them with the lords and the princes or the authorities of his day. So from the outside of the poem, you see him asking, where can I find some holy sweet flowers? And he asked the Quetzal hummingbird and he asked the coyote, you know, the butterflies and all of nature is, is responding back to him. And hummingbirds um, steps forward and it's really flying and says, I will lead you to this flower, flower world, paradise. Place. And so the hummingbird leads him into this place and there's a multitude of gem-like flowers just shooting light beauty and color. And music just... uh, bouncing off the mountain the yeah. music from the mountain is bouncing off the rocks off the rivers it's, if anybody's familiar with the guadalupe story it might sound familiar yeah it's starting to sound familiar okay <laughs> so in in this immersion of this place he's ecstatic so he starts grabbing up all the flowers and he get, specifically gathers them in his tilma and the term is quashanko and the, the native the Nahuatl, but basically he goes, he takes those flowers and he goes down the hill and he shares them with the princes. Everybody's celebrating and they're singing and giving honor to the God of Fawnir. I bring this up because this is an important name, if you could remember it. It's in Tloke Nawake, the God of Fawnir. But very soon after that, there's a shift in the song. It, it feels as though, well, it more than feels that. It's very, he, curious. It's very curious. He actually starts conveying I wish I could, rem I'm remembering these, these flowers and I wish I could go there. I, I, I'm so sad I didn't go there. <laughs> and he says, the reason why I didn't go there is because he who was worthless and afflicted and whose sins on earth can't go to this flowery paradise. And which is very sad, of course, but he laments, he's crying laments out and he's because crying he, out. he remembered going there, but he didn't actually go there. And, and after explaining why he, he couldn't, go there he does give an out he explains that there the one way that one could go to this flower of paradise is only if the god of far and near makes one worthy of this place so the song ends unfortunately in a lament because he can't go there there's a barrier right it's sounding very much like a paradise type loss scenario um which is which is sort of a common theme but where and know, a lot of pagan cultures have a cultures. have a paradise loss type Mytho mythological story mm -hmm. and and you know, with that of losing the achieve it because of the lack of worthiness you also have the genesis of a, a hero's story a partial one but the beginning of one where you have someone with a quest who's looking for something trying to gain it he has mentors who are helping him along the way but unfortunately in this particular case he's unable to achieve the quest so it, this ancient song poem ends on this this partial note where things are unfulfilled, where things are uncompleted. So he's and a he's, failed hero. He's, right. And where he's saying, I wish I could smell those intoxicating sweet flowers. And it ends. Hmm. Um, 
So now this has not gone unnoticed. I mean, mm-hmm. within the secular world, um, you know, when we present this, when we give this presentation, so many people are saying, wait a minute, I didn't know that there was this ancient song poem that mirrors the Guadalupe narrative. You know, where are you guys coming from? I've never heard this. No, it's it's true. I mean, I, I think we kind of have to let the cat out of the bag uh, to know what the secular scholarship knows. Yes, it's 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 identical. I mean, it's undeniable that there's a connection between the Quicapecayot and the Guadalupe narrative. Unfortunately, there's even in, a book out there about it. Yeah, there there was a book that was put out in 2000 in Spanish called Tonantzin Guadalupe by the Mexican scholar Miguel Leon Portilla. Uh, he gives an analysis of the Nicamopo. We're going to get into that later. That's the Nahuatl language account of the Guadalupe narrative. That's the one that everybody really knows these days, mm-hmm. the English translation of it. But he gives a thorough analysis of it, and mm-hmm. he compares it to the Cuica Pecayo, mm-hmm. Um mm-hmm. and, and talks about the, 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 the plot lines, the symbology, the metaphors, everything that is that, that you see in both accounts. Um, and so really the way secular scholars talk about this is they say, well, obviously this is either the source material for a fabricated Guadalupe narrative, mm-hmm. or it's syncretism that might have grown spontaneously from the indigenous culture. Um, it's kind of like a, a like a rebranding of, of you yeah, know, an you. Aztec goddess to uh, Guadalupe. Um, and, um, but we thought that now that we're letting the cat out of the bag to the Catholic world, we are making another way to look at this. Yes. It is neither one or two. It is evangelical preparation, which is an accepted Christian doc- doctrine brought up by Eusebius, early Christian doctrine. It's in, it's called preparatio evangelica. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that century. is really kind of the, the, the hypothesis that is, that is the methodology upon which we base our, our book. Mm-hmm. So we yeah. continue on if you'd like. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me, before I forget, let me ask you two things. Um, mass Azteca, is that how you say it? Mis Azteca. Mis Azteca. Mis Azteca. Yeah, like Azteca. Aztec mass. Yeah, that's what yeah Aztec saying. mass, mm-hmm. right? Is that available mm-hmm. like on streaming services to hear or listen to? Or I'd love to, I'd really love to hear that from beginning to end. And I thought I was looking. Oh, okay. For, is it available? <laughs> You're well, like, oh. Well, we don't have a full professional recording, but there is a SoundCloud that has all of the movements. Yeah, maybe we can give, we'll give you the link of the SoundCloud. Of I did. It's beautiful. I did. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it, it's almost an hour long. It's eight movements. Um, I, yes. That's something about a lot of the, the scholars saying fabricated, and that, that kept on, every time you said that, I was always like, fabricated? I never even knew that any, any scholars or anybody thought this was, and it's not, I'm not surprised, other than maybe the early... You know, <laughs> war like the entire. Oh my gosh! The, the entire academic constantly, right? I'm like, yeah. mm-hmm. I didn't know there were scholars out there that were were kind of dismissing the Guadalupe event, Juan mm-hmm. Diego, all this stuff. Oh boy, do we have a Rusty. lot to tell you? We could, we could <laughs> I know. I'm so this, sad now. I, I wanted to live in ignorance. Oh, no, no, no. There is no. a battle and- raging, and it's been going on for since the 1700s. Yes. A lot of these arguments, yes. and it, they actually give it, have a name. They call, they're called anti-apparitionists. apparitionists. It's okay. a cottage industry. There are so many anti-Guadalupe sad. books out there that attack every single oh, element, right. not only the validity of the, or invalidity, they think of the tilma, but also whether the millions of conversions happen, happened. happened and, and why is that? Juan why, Diego exists. Why? Why? Why do you think that is the? Why do you think? What's the main reason you think that this is? That these people are so. I think the, well, I think the basic idea is that the entire nation of Mexico is pretty much, for all intents and purposes, built on. This the app the Guadalupe encounter. It has such a sort of an entrenchment in people's hearts and souls. And just a, to give an anecdote on on kind of why they attack Guadalupe first is um, one time we were doing a presence a presentation at the Bowers Museum in Santa Ana, California. They were doing a, a tour of the the Guadalupe image, and they asked us to come and speak. 
And at the end of a, it was kind of a long presentation, but everybody was was very involved. And at the end of it, during the question answer, a woman stood up who's from Mexico. And she said, you know, when I was in university in Mexico, my first, one of my first days in the class, in a class, the professor, this actually happened. The pre- professor said to entire student body, if you believe in Guadalupe, you need to pack your stuff and leave her right now because we're here to talk about intellectual things. We're here to talk about something with more rigor. And she was so disheartened. She was actually crying when she, she was told crying us this. as she was telling us from the audience. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, she pretty much put her faith on the shelf in order to finish her degree. And what she told us is she said, you know, I wish I would have heard your your hypothesis earlier mm-hmm. on because I didn't have any way to respond to him. It, you know, uh, and and that's really the way that it goes right now. Oh, we can tell you there's um oh my I I mean it is actually probably a consensus within the secular scholarship world mm-hmm. that Guadalupe is a myth, uh, oh, a, a okay. bad it makes, myth, a false myth. It makes myth. sense then because there's so many I've had many friends that have gone to colleges whether it's in LA or bit, you know, and specific places that mm-hmm. The professors are anti-God too. So if you believe in God, a lot of times mm-hmm. you're, you know, that's a little behind mm-hmm. the times. So this, this this makes this would make sense. Yeah, and if you're right. Hispanic, that's the first thing you're going to hear. Certainly in a Chicano studies class, it's the very first thing you're going to hear is, "I know you all love Guadalupe, but you got to just put it aside. You need to start the think ra- thinking rationally now." Oh what, gosh, and some, some of these papers are so snarky. <laughs> <laughs> they, have such a, just like, they have such a demeaning uh, tone to them. I, just really ridicule anybody who be- who believes in Guadalupe. I, I'm glad now to be like interviewing you to know, talk about this. So you know, any kind of platform that can get this out in a positive way and to be pushing, oh, I, we're gonna we're gonna help here, and we're all gonna fight this together, right? Great. Right. Yes. Great. Right. We have to. Yes. We have to band together. Yes. So you offer obviously offer a very fresh, unprecedented perspective on the the Guadalupe and Connor. You know, maybe you want to tell me a little bit more like that and explain as well uh, the the flower world prophecy. Okay. Well, the reason why we say that is we can even just start with the Guadalupe encounter itself. From the very beginning, when Juan Diego is approaching the hill at Tepeyac, He's, he finds himself immersed in this paradisal realm of intense color and beauty, light emanating from everything and song just surrounding him. Echoing from the mountains mm-hmm. to the river, to the mm-hmm. rocks and back and forth. Mm-hmm. And it causes such an intense reaction in him. We find him saying, could I be in the place our ancestors spoke of, the flower world paradise? And he then gives the Nahuatl term for that for flower world paradise which is in Shoshitlalpan in Tonacatlalpan. Now this is a really interesting sentence. It's like covering a ton of material. First and foremost, it's very clear that he already knew about this place because he alludes to his ancient ancestors telling him about it, not the Spanish. And the second part is the term that he uses in Shoshitlalpan and Tonacatlalpan is a very loaded term that's directly related to uh, a new study, inter- interdisciplinary study that's erupted in the last 15 to 20 years called Flower World Studies. And basically what these studies have discovered is that flower world or the flower world paradise is a spiritual afterlife paradisal realm that millions of people throughout the Americas believe in. And it covers such a huge geographical range. It's going up in the Southwest um, United American States. Southwest. It covers all of Mexico and it goes into the top of su- uh, South America. So millions and millions of people over a vast ge- geographical range believe in this paradise realm called flower world. And it, along with that, they also discovered how old it is. They date it to about 1500 to 900 BC. And the reason why they were able to hard date it that far back is because of those disciplines we're dealing with archaeology, anthropology, linguistics, and a host of other disciplines, including art and history, etc. So they're able to hard date it based on temples, pyramids, pottery shards, shards, murals. So Teotihuacan is, is within that a lot of Mayan pyramids are are reflect are this reflect flower, this world, flower world paradise right. so it's it's very pervasive and and a very intense so you see it in the different languages this belief in this flower world. 
Right. And and there's there's kind of an important concept um, that you have to understand in order to be able to uh, to see why archaeologists and anthropologists can say, well, we can see this uh, flower world belief in material objects. It has to do with this concept called the axis mundi or the world axis. Uh, axis. What it what it basically is is um, it's a three dimensional model of a multi dimensional reality. So in this case, you would have the four directions uh, the, on the horizontal plane, north, south, east, and west, which represent Earth. Now, specifically in, in other cultures, you have a similar concept, but it would, might be a sacred tree or a sacred mountain or something like that. Connecting heaven and earth. So yeah, that's there's, what the there's, there's, a, there's a vertical axis, which either goes from the underworld to the horizontal plane, which rep represents the earth, or it transcends upward to the flower world paradise. Now, in order to make that connection between earth, earth and the beautiful paradisal afterlife is... A four-petaled flower is superimposed over this horizontal plane. So what that represents is that it is through beauty. It is through the experience of earthly beauty that we get a glimpse of divine beauty. But it's not only just beauty, because in this case, in Xochitlalpan, in Tonacatlalpan, Xochit means flower, but Tona means heat or energy, or it's the associated sun. with the sun. So it's, it's, it's life-sustaining. It's creativity. So it it, it um, th this two term the one that Juan Diego believe it or not believe brings up at the beginning of the Guadalupe encounter is loaded with meaning. It's essentially meaning the place of ultimate beauty, the place of ultimate truth, ultimate creativity. That's mm -hmm. what this flower world paradise is. And it's the exact same term that we find in that ancient song poem we were talking about, Quicapacao. It's the exact same. It's the in exact Lapan and Tonacat Lapan. Yeah, where the singer wants to go to to find the flowers is this flower world paradise. So the way, getting back to how it's shown, well, in, in material objects, is that you see this four-petaled flower everywhere. You see one in La Blanca, Guatemala, on the side of a hill. You see them represented in pottery shards that they have today. It's in mural paintings. And but, it's always associated with mountains. Yes. and uh, That's the uh, vertical axis. Okay. You have to and, up. Uh, so let me, so it, it, it also is, uh, came to be known to, um, or is associated with the concept called flower mountains. So let me try to explain this. There are three pyramids outside of Mexico City in a place called Teotihuacan. Um, recently, in 1980 and also in the early 2000s, they discovered shafts underneath two of these pyramids, the Pyramid of the Sun and the Pyramid of the Plume Serpent. There's actually a documentary on this uh, PBS documentary called Secrets of the Dead. Um, 2014. Lost Kings of Teotihuacan. I think that's Secrets what it's of the called. Dead, I think. So, yeah, something like that. But they go into this recent excavation that has occurred. So what is so interesting about it is they thought that perhaps these pyramids were royal tombs. That's what they first um, thought. Like the Egyptian pyramids, but they didn't find that. What they found is there's this tunnel that uh that that goes underneath these two pyramids and it it emanates into a four-lobed chamber that's almost that's mm -hmm. directly underneath the middle of the mm -hmm. pyramid. And it's filled with iridescent objects. And, yeah, and the, flower there's pyrite full gold yeah. that lines it's, the it's tunnel glowing. and it leads to these 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 four lobed um you know cave as I was saying. So the the and way that, little guys. The, the the way they're interpreting it through the lens of flower world that we've been talking about is that it's a way through death that you're able hopefully to reach this paradisal realm. And that in the center of this pyramid of this four-lobed cave, which is a representation of a four-lobed flower, you're able to ascend upward to the flower world paradise. Now, what is so weird about the pyramid of the plume serpent is that what they found are four little little statues, um, statues of, of, of four people that are leaning, and they're actually looking at the axis wounding. They're, they're looking at the center point. And the way the archaeologists explain it is that it's it's showing an anticipation or a hope to go to the flower world paradise. So um, what's the name of that that's... What's the name of pardon that? me? What's the name of that mountain again? 
Well, it's actually a pyramid. It's the pyramid of the plumes. It's either it's called the pyramid of the plume serpent or the feathered serpent. Or the feathered serpent. Sometimes it's called the pyramid of Quetzalcoatl. I want to um, look it so, up a little later and see some. If, if there yeah, oh, check yeah. that out. Yeah, yeah I wanna, check I, it out. I really want to see that. If you could find some papers on the pyramid of the sun, there's actually a diagram of the shaft and how it goes into a four lobe flower fl flower uh, in inside the pyramid. Actually, if we go to the De Young um, Museum in San Francisco, they actually have put out a book called Teotihuacan City of Fire, City of something else, and they they go into this. So yeah. if, you're, if you want to, it, it's it actually yeah, uh, it's, it's, it. it's spelled out on the website. They have a really great interactive mm -hmm. uh, uh, website that goes into this. Um, so if if we can we can continue on if, if yeah, you'd like us to whatever you want to all right because now we can start. Okay, so. Now, what, what's going, what happened is that the um, Franciscan friars, they were the first missionaries to come in after the fall of the Aztec Empire, which happened in 1521. Uh, they many of them arrived in 1524. Some of them arrived in 1523. But um, they needed to, number one, be able to speak the Nahuatl language. It took them two years to learn it. They needed to know the culture. So they documented a lot of the the culture and also what was a song a tradition that they found that the Nawa people have it was these, it was it was a a thing that the cultural thing they had called song poems now these song poems are similar in a lot of different cultures you even find in European cultures with the troubadour trouver um mm -hmm. tradition in Europe, where they, they not only wrote son sonnets, but they also carried the history of the people, kind of like the town crier who would, uh, or the singer that would go from kind of village to village and say the exploits of the king or something, and and, and kind of like the newspaper boy, <laughs> perhaps. Well, a similar thing so happened. So these routes and right. share, keep on sharing the, the song poems. That's how they did things. Right. So a lot of history we that we know about are through these collected song poems. They were memorized. Um, even but they didn't the, record it until after the Guadalupe encounter, just to make clarity. They didn't record it before. They didn't know about them before. Right. The Guadalupe encounter. Right. So, um, you know, there's there's even ideas about uh, the Iliad and, and so many things that, that were written in verse that were probably memorized before they were written down. But that's a whole other subject, but we won't get into that. But anyway... This happened in Mesoamerica, and uh, it was it was um, around 1558 to 1561 that uh, Fr the Franciscan friar Bernardino de Sahagún uh, went with some of his students to collect these ancient song poems. And uh, over the course of about the first century, 180 Aztec song poems were collected, but 90 of them are the result of this one collection by Sagun between these years, 1558, 1561. That collection became to known, came to be known as the Cantares Mexicanos. The Mexicanos are that's actually the name of the Aztecs of the people, uh, the Mexica. That's uh and they're one among many groups. one among many uh city states. Um most people think it was all you know, everybody was Aztec, you know, Aztec all the time. They it were the minority. That. Actually. Um in fact. People erroneously say that Juan Diego was an Aztec he or Mexica. He wasn't. He would have been actually a Texcocan or from the Alcoa. But that's the subject. We'll get into that later. Okay, so um, these song poems, as we already talked about, the primary metaphor of them is a singer calling down flowers or truth okay. from heaven so he could gather them in his, in his tilma and present them to the lords and princes. So there's an interesting concept here. It's called flower in song. In Nahuatl, it's called in xochit in cuicat. Now, the idea here is that a composer gets inspiration from the flower world paradise, the place of ultimate truth and beauty. He calls down those flowers or those songs from heaven to in inspire him so that he can sing them and send them back to his creator. So there's this reciprocal relationship between the creator on earth and the ultimate creator in heaven. This is a kind of a thumbnail of flower and song. And it's it's this place of inspiration that I think kind of musicians, and I know you're a musician yourself, that that feeling of of intoxication that 
this place that we go to, place. this transcendent place we go to when we're composing, when we're performing, especially when you're singing, oh, in this case, sacred music, uh, the, the the feeling you get when you're singing Gregorian chant, for example, or, or beautiful right? polyphony, it's it, uh, it becomes something that you just crave, you want to go back to that place. Well, this place is the way in which we can experience, we can get a glimpse of the flower of paradise. So, um, we're talking about Nawa philosophy right now. And, and this is a, a little bit of a, of a thumbnail. So as we were saying, this is setting us up. This is a little bit of background that we need to know in order to go into the Guadalupe narrative. But before we get into that, we have to talk about the influence of the missionaries, the Franciscan missionaries in particular, and what knowledge they would have given to the Nawa at that time. So the Spanish missionaries, when they got there in 1524, obviously they didn't know about all of this background and they were giving just a straightforward Christian catechesis, which is that you need to turn away from paganism um, right. through Jesus Christ, uh, repent of your idolatrous ways and be baptized in the Christian faith. So even while there might have been a lot of miscommunications and there were, and I'll, and I'll go into that in a second, they at least were able to transmit that much information. So unfortunately, because they didn't have a knowledge of the culture and the language and, and many other components, while they had a few converts, a few important converts and their followers, as a general rule, the majority of the Valley of Mexico and Mesoamerica rejected the Christian message to the point where Bishop Zumadaga, who was actually involved with Juan Diego and the Tilma, Right before the Guadalupe encounter occurred, you find him writing in a letter to the king of Spain, we're failing, we're not convincing the indigenous, we might as well just pack up and go home. Right, exactly. So now we go into the Guadalupe account known as the Nicomopoa. Is, is that okay? Do you have any questions for us? No, not quite yet. This, this, I, I'm in, intoxicated here. <laughs> that's, that's a good word that's a good word, word. <laughs> yes i mean you know it, it, it's i mean i'm i'm getting well if i will just say one thing i guess is like it just sounds you know to me and i've been studying a little bit more of this is where they're they're being presented a monotheistic understanding here ultimately prefigurement right through mary yes. the mesoamerican people are basically this goes way far back just like it would in, in old testament leading up to christ we also have this beautiful early, early glimpse of heaven, you know, what their understanding is heaven, right? And of course, with the flowers and what you'll lead into in the Tilma of Juan Diego and the flowers he brings, this really connects the dots into the connection here. Yes. Exactly, exactly. The way that we explain it is we say that these ideas that were implanted by God, uh, you know, mm -hmm. into the Mesoamerican culture, find their fulfillment in a, in a fully Christian context in the Guadalupe event. We concentrate on what we call four conceptual pillars. One of them, number one, is the transcendentals, beauty, truth, and goodness. This is really talking about the flowers. The flower is the dominant symbol for ultimate truth. Number two is life after mm -hmm. death. And this is everything we're talking about with the flower world paradise, the idea of a beautiful floral realm, paradisal realm filled with beauty and music. Um, that's the second one. The third one is a one supreme God that leads us to our fourth one, who makes you worthy. Number four is worthiness. So we make, we plot these concepts for 3000 years from the Olmec period to the Mayan to the Teotihuacan uh, periods and we trace how these concepts developed and how they eventually were turned into flower song poems and um, the, the ways in which uh, academics are interpreting these flower song poems. And then, of course, we give our own interpretation of them, too. We even give our own translation of these flower song poems in the book. Yeah. In the book. But um, so we say that with these four conceptual pillars that I just said, they provide a bridge of understanding. Mm -hmm. They 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 provide a bridge that could lead someone who is pagan but is firmly entrenched in these four conceptual pillar pillars, albeit in a pagan way, can be able to make the bridge 
and and be able to, to uh, become Christian. So I'll give you a couple I, examples right now. So wait, did you want to say something? Uh, oh, oh no. Okay, no, no. please go go right ahead. Okay, I, just I was just saying yes. <laughs> Okay, so, well, the, the way in which this would occur is that at the beginning of the Guadalupe story, Juan Diego, they many times you might have read the translation that they say he's a humble Indian, he's a poor Indian, um, you know, commoner, things like that. Well, the word in, in Nahuatl is masahual. Uh, now, that does translate into a commoner, but there's a much more historical there's, a, there's another definition. Definition there's of definitions. It. It, it really means somebody who is not worthy. So when you say somebody is not worthy of heaven, you use the term masajuelo, which is a, a form of masajual. So what, it, what it's actually meaning is that this is one was a person who was not worthy of entering the flower world paradise. But of course, what we find at the very beginning is he does enter the flower world paradise. It's the same description in the earlier song poem, Quica Pecao, and other flower song poems that we find. It has the same words, the same birds, the same echoing. Like there's multiple characteristics of flower world that are attached to it. And, and it's perfectly matched. It's perfectly so strange matched. because the same species of birds are actually in both accounts. Really? Tzinitzkan and Coyotol. Yes, the Tzinitzkan means the trogon bird. It's from mm -hmm. a species called the Trogonus mexicanus. The coyotot, coyototot bird is the jingle bell bird. Um, both of those exact same birds are mentioned in, in the Quica in the, the, the real ancient Quica song Pecaio poem. And the Nicomopoa. So, um, so Juan Diego, as an undeserving commoner, goes into the flower parasite. Now, this wasn't supposed to happen because according to Nahuatl belief, only the nobility or the warriors or women who died in childbirth could go to the flower world paradise. Everyone else was so, not allowed to go. So this is breaking the entire paradigm from the very beginning. And um, and you could even, even Juan Diego addresses it. When me, Monique was giving the um, what Juan Diego said, what she left out was that he says, the first thing he says is, am I worthy of what I'm hearing? Mm -hmm. And then he says, could, could, I be know, in the place? could I be in the place of my ancestors spoke about, the flower world paradise? Yeah. So why is the very first thing he says is, am I worthy to be here? It's because it's a continuation of the way the Quiquepecayot mm -hmm. ends. It ends with the singer wondering if he is worthy to enter the flower world paradise using the exact same Nahuatl terms. But mm -hmm. now we have a continuation, mm -hmm. a through line of it picks up where Juan Diego as a masajual, as a commoner, walks in and suddenly is in this flower paradise. And the first thing he says is, could I be worthy? It's a strange question. It's a strange even... question, unless he had and knowledge, he... he connected it to this these earlier songs. Here's the devout Catholic who would have been... Uh, in a state of grace, because he was on his way to Mass. He was probably contemplating the Eucharist. He he probably uh, would have been readying himself for Mass because he would have been instructed by the priest at that time to do that. It was a 14-mile walk that he was taking that morning when he encounters Guadalupe and wanders into the flower of paradise. So we're hoping we're showing that quickly this connection is made between Nawa concepts and the Christian idea of, of heaven, and that the and that the 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 the, the pagan Nawa could make that bridge, they could cross that bridge if they wanted. But that's just that's just number one. We shall go on. Yeah. The second point is the one supreme God. Now, as we said before, Monique was talking about that the earlier poem says that it's only in Tloke Nawake, the God of far and near, makes that you makes worthy. you worthy to enter the flower world paradise. Well, when he finally meets Guadalupe, she gives five identifiers of who she is. She, she says, says it in the Nahuatl language. She's saying it in the Nahuatl language. Mm -hmm. She says, I am the mother of the one true God, which is in Neli Teo Dios. Dios. She also says a term called Ipanemwani, which means life giver. But she also book. says, I am the mother of Intloke Nahuake, the God of far and near. 
the exact same term that's in the earlier poem mm -hmm. of the, the God who can make you worthy to enter the flowerwood paradise. So she herself is making this connection to Nahuatl concepts of grace, if we you will. We have to be very careful with this because we're not theologians. And we're, we you can know, use that word. Uh, I mean, I, you know, there's there, we know there's a lot more implications to it, but it's it's kind of a a concept that can lead them to say, okay, she is the mother of Intlokanawake. We know about these earlier song poems. And this is the description or the attributes or the essence of this one supreme God who can make us worthy. So that's connection number two. I'll just keep going on while we're at it. Number three, beauty, truth, and goodness, the transcendentals. I think we've kind of already made the case that the Nawa had a sort of belief in beauty, truth, and goodness. They had a this connection of earthly beauty with divine beauty and divine truth. So when Juan Diego at the very end or close to the end of the story gathers those flowers, he is gathering ultimate truth. He's possessing, he is possessing it, but of, but of course he's actually gathering logos, which is Jesus Christ, the ultimate beauty. And the, the, the savior who, whose mangled body on the, the cross is actually the ultimate sign of beauty because what he did, how he as the God-man sacrificed himself to make people worthy to be able to enter uh, eternity uh, with their creator. So er, it, it enter paradise. So we are saying that by Juan Diego gathering these flowers, he not only does what I just said, but he also completes the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. He he attains the goal. He attains what man had been looking for for millennia, Eternity, including almost. those four, we call them the four little guys that are underneath the pyramid of the plume serpent, the ones that were looking towards heaven and craving. desiring and craving it. He actually finds that flower. He makes he, he's God grants him the ability to make that ultimate connection between the flowers from heaven and the ones that he gathers in his tilma. But there's more to it, of course. He needs to, this is this is hero's journey talk right now. He needs to return with the elixir. He needs to come back with the head of Grendel. He needs to come back with the earth from Frodo, from Lords of the Ring, yeah, yeah. in order to show that he had completed his task. Quest. So he goes down to the hill, he shows him to the prince of the church, who is the bishop, Zumarga. And of course, we get an even further miracle because of the image of the Blessed Mother on his tilma. Yeah, to top it off, he gets this image. Right, exactly. So, so all this together, it proves that now with the knowledge of what the missionaries gave them, what makes you worthy then? Well, you must repent, you must turn from your pagan ways, and you must get baptized. It, it was also very clear in their message that it was only a priest who could baptize you, who gave you the who, who was given the authority to baptize. And so in mass, as we know, over you know, nine million people uh, within the decade, indigenous came to craving and crying and going over crags and mountains and using sticks as crutches and carrying their children on their back. Many of the women were pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it makes sense. They had such an intense reaction because if you if you look at it in the context of that older song poem and then Juan Diego is actually able to go there and they make the connection that the reason why he's able to go there is because he's a baptized Christian, that it translates that the hero, Juan Diego as a hero, he, he fulfilled the quest. The reason why he fulfilled the quest, it gives the impetus to every other indigenous in the area to say, if that's how he got there, then we have to do the same. We'll give up our indigenous pra our, our idolatrous practices. We'll give up our multiple wives. We'll give up our slaves and we will go and repent and beg a priest for baptism and that is what happened and we will follow juan diego's example as the hero who had to go through who, had to, who was ridiculed by his own people who was you know laughed at who was doubted by the authorities we have to we have to go after our own salvation with zeal and and you see that we have to be the heroes in our own hero story so just to uh, button up another concept is the whole idea of the earlier poem being a paradise lost story. Well, the Nikon Moboa is a paradise, paradise gained story. It's part two 
of a long, not only hero's journey, but a meta narrative. Grand meta narrative. The, 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 the Guadalupe story that that we all know that we've probably grown up with perhaps is actually part two of a, of God's salvific plan for the Americas. Yes. Yes. Amen. Yeah. Man, that's what I was, uh, that's what I was thinking too. Well, there and, are... and one other thing. Yeah, right. no, no, please go ahead. Go right ahead. Oh, oh sorry. I'm just going to say that, you know, in, in encountering all of this information and, and piecing it together, you know, it, it helps to resolve a lot of those issues that we were telling you about earlier about the anti apparitionists and a lot of the material that they use to try and discredit the Guadalupan event. One of the pieces of evidence or lack thereof that they use is that there isn't a, the historical record doesn't bear out that millions of people went to Tepeyac, saw the Toma, and then converted. Instead, what you see, you have all of the accounts of hundreds, thousands, millions of people coming from outlying areas to the closest priest and just asking for baptism and not going to Tepeyac. There's only one account that mentions Tepeyac saying that 60,000 people were converted in, in one particular instance. But other than that, you see um, the account centered around, there's like eight other monasteries and you see them coming into those monasteries. And why this is an important point is because um, what Monique just described is another way in which secular scholars use to discredit the Guadalupe account. And they do. And they say, well, their argument is, well, if it was the Tilma that converted everybody, why don't we have more historical e evidence of people, mm -hmm. millions of people coming to Tepeyac during that time and then asking for, for baptism? Now, we're, we are not in any way we denigrating the tilma. the tilma or demeaning its importance of its role. We are saying that the, the image of the Tilma is part of a larger network of miraculous uh, preparation. That artistic it, preparation, artistic preparation, art, artistic miracles that were meant to communicate uh, the, the the truths to lead them eventually to the truth of Christianity. So, um, so what we do in our in our book is that we make a distinction between the millions of conversions. We say that more than likely the 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 indigenous would have been converted where they were, and because of the story, because the flower song we. There, there's evidence that actually the Guadalupe encounter itself would have turned into a flower song. And just as we were saying before, news got out, the troubadours, the trouvers that, that would go out and give the news, that more than likely a single song would have been composed, It'd would have shade out. would have been memorized as it went from village to village, because they used to have music schools, memorization was, schools. Was very key it would have kind of like a meme that would have replicated, would have replicated and it would have just spread throughout the land. And we actually have an eyewitness account. Um, his name is Luis Becerra Tanco. He's a he's a, mm -hmm. a priest mm -hmm. who said that he eyewitnessed the performance of the Guadalupe song. Our song, where two men are, are in the middle, and mm -hmm. and 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 there's um, a, a person playing two different types of native drums, a teponatsli and a wewet, and dancers around them. And they were singing the account of Guadalupe. Guadalupe. So um, that's also in our book. So we are saying per tradition, it would have gone out. It would have touched people because that's another thing about this is that the song poems were meant to give an, an emotional impact, just yes. like art art does. does. So uh, it, it would have affected them. And then they would have come in to, to try to find the, the closest priest for baptism. And, um, you know, if you've read, ever read any of these accounts, they're, they're heartbreaking. Oh, uh, they're they're yeah. waiting mm -hmm. for months outside of a, of a mission, uh, waiting to be uh, baptized. Yeah. In fact, there's one account where there was a period of time where baptisms where the Vatican asked for the baptisms to be held off for uh, to verify that the conversions were sincere, that they were authentic. So it, was about, it lasts about three or four months. And in this period of time, many people were going to the monasteries and begging for baptism. The priest had to tell them no. So they started camping out at the monasteries. Um, and one particular account, it's really sad. There's these two old ladies who had traveled quite a distance. I think it was something like um, 75 miles. Um, and they would carry their homes on their back, just so you know. So they they carried all their belongings. And when they were told by the priest that they couldn't get baptized, they start with, they were just weeping and wailing, saying, "Please, you have to baptize us because we could die at any moment, and we don't want to die without the sacraments." Right, and they, they were crippled, so they 
they were both leaning on each, each other, other to, to, to um, be able to make it. Yeah, they they, 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 they described them as both being crippled, crippled, but they were only able to move Together. forward be, if if they both leaned on each other and moved forward. So, so, so many of these accounts are just are just heartbreaking. But um, I, were, I know we've gone on for a long time. So um, you were saying a few months ago, did you happen to watch uh, our lady, lady of Guadalupe, the 2020 movie that was done? Because it's a real, I, I thought it was a really well done film, kind of an indie, lower budget movie. But I actually learned a lot in that movie about the baptisms. And in that movie, they really emphasized, it was a movie that went, uh, did you see it? it no, it, I don't think I it, think it, I heard about I it. I think it was a Mexican production. I, I'm it was kind of like a God's it, Not Dead. Okay. Yes, it, yes, it kind of was. It went into the into the present day and it went back into the past and there was a love story connected. And I actually thought they did a really well job. I love oh, the love it. story. Los I, Corazones, is that Los the Corazones, it was a, he was he the, he was going to get divorced from his wife or something that and one? they made I think up. it had something to do with more like a pregnancy and it, she got in an accident and she died in the it and oh, and how cool. and how he dealt, I think how he dealt with it and in the in the story of Juan Diego, I guess his wife died, and and there was all these people that were just I don't know if this was even true. That's what I'm saying. I don't know how much the movie is even true, but what I did take from the movie was the essence of baptism, and, and what they really show was how those early um, uh, Aztecs were really walking away from the pagan god, and Juan Diego changes his name. Right, because that was not even his name, Juan Diego. Correct? He had a completely different name, which I was like, "Oh, I didn't know that." So I did learn a little bit something from the movie, and you know, researched a few things. It was like, "Oh, he took a bap." You know, he took a that was his baptism name. That is correct. Yes, it was right. Quatlot Quat which means "Eagle Who Speaks." That was his original name, and he changed it to Juan Diego. Yeah, that's yeah. his baptismal name. In, in terms of in terms of the baptisms, the primary source uh, for the baptisms was written by Fray uh, Toribio. Toribio Buenavente de Motolonia, Franciscan friar. Um, he was compelled under obedience to document what was going on, and um, it's really funny because he he even says, you know, I'm not a good writer, and I'm only doing this because I have to. It's really he goes, I'm, you know, you hear all but, of that in the beginning, you know, at the very beginning. But he's uh, he starts giving all these accounts of of uh, one section he's collecting from all his fellow friars. It wasn't just what he eyewitnessed, but what he got from uh, the other priests that mm -hmm. were there. Now that is the primary source. It's such a beautiful book. I, I wish that it was In more English. available. Yeah, um, there is true. a version by Elizabeth Foster, right? Who... But there's, but they only did uh, 500 copies. This was back in the 50s. So since then, there hasn't been a proper rendition translation of, of the scholars, pieces. How, how can scholars be against something like that would be so documented like like that? I mean, how could anybody be anti? this particular you know the guadalupe event when we have a friar that you yeah, know the writing franciscan friar that's you know we have some really solid material here i mean oh what, boy you, you just opened up a can, can of worms, worms. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> like you like oh, you would not i always believe. open up can of worms that's you know that's my family i'm like the can of worms man yeah okay i'll, tr I'll try this is to, good though okay i'll try to give a, a a thumbnail there's so much behind it okay for, first of all um and i'll probably bounce off one of one of the primary anti-apparitionist is actually a monsignor his name is monsignor stafford pool uh he's yes. written two very scathing anti-guadalupe books now i even uh, the the Multiple one is article. called um guadalupe a mexican national symbol correct I think I even know the page. I think it's page 38, 238. He actually says there is no evidence of millions of conversions ever occurring. So he flat out says it. He doesn't says substantiate he, he doesn't it. Cite it. He doesn't say anything, but he 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 states that. And unfortunately, he's been he has he's, been cited. He's he's unfortunately he's considered the foremost expert in Guadalupe. But really? when he starts out with this lie, and of course, everybody yeah. believes him. 
they don't go further. Well, okay. So the reason is he, modern? We- is he somebody of, I mean, how, how, when, it, when did he write this stuff? Is he still alive? Is this particular Monsignor? Is this he a- just passed died. away, what, two years two ago? Two years ago. Right. Oh. Um, he, uh, okay. So what happened is that in the canonization of Juan Diego, which occurred in 2002, uh, his case was opened in 1996. So you will find a lot of publications between 1996 and 2002, where kind of scholars kind of finally start to deal with um, on both sides start digging uh, into of the, the pro-apparitionist and anti-apparitionist. And um, so many of these questions were brought up, but, th- but this is nothing. I mean, this has been going back. The primary document, anti-apparition document, was really written in 1882 by a gentleman named Garcia Iscalbaceta. Now, now a lot of the, the arguments that, that we have against Guadalupe um, really still come from this one publication. Although it does tag team off an earlier publication that kind of addresses the same issues. These issues have been around almost from the beginning, so it seems, but we have the best record of it in Icaz Balseta. So modern scholars use his document. It starts kind of with him. Like even many of these arguments even have names. One of them is called the argument of silence. Okay. Mm-hmm. And what that is dealing with is if Guadalupe was such an important event, why is there not more documentation, early documentation? of this occurring. Now, I know I just opened up another can of worms. <laughs> oh, I want to try to get to I've always questions. read there's like 9 million conversions or something around that. And, you know, I just wanted to, you know, clarify. So I, I've always read that there's been tons of conversions, but. Well, let me, let me go back to the, to the uh, 9 million conversion argument. Um, besides Stafford Poole making this argument, many people are saying, well, uh, uh, Motolonia, he was exaggerating because he was trying to get funding from the king and from Rome. So he had to exaggerate the, the numbers, the numbers of his of his success. What is so I mean, just right off the bat, um, I mean, there's so <laughs> many <laughs> ideas in that. But number one, when you read this, it's called the history of the Indians of New Spain. That's that's the book that he wrote. When you read this, he is actually very apologetic. He's saying, I don't know why everybody is converting. It's, it's he, not it's, us. We didn't he explicitly even... states that we, the priests have no clue why before 1531, there was hardly any conversions and why after 1531, all of a sudden millions of people were coming and they were so overwhelmed. So he actually was itemizing, okay, here's this one conversion experience. So you can sort of get an idea. It was this many priests and they had to baptize this many people. So they lined them up in rows and they had to, to give the sacrament in this, in this, in such a way we did this many marriages. We did this many confessions. And this is a typical day for an average friar. So he does it as a preface to kind of explain where his numbers are coming from. And right. he, this is a guy who was, uh, his reputation was widely known both in Spain and in Mexico for being so spe- like hyper scrupulous. hyper scrupulous on anything he said. He he hated to say anything out of turn without being able to back it up. So to have that type of reputation, even among people who didn't necessarily like him, and then to have that type of accusation is kind of strange. Right. So the primary sources is, is the Motolunia. The two secondary sources would have come from uh, another priest called Mendieta mm-hmm. and another one named Torquemada. They are these are documents that were written later on in the century, but they they back up what Motolonia says. Mm-hmm. Also, another secondary source would be the pipe, the papal bulls that that um, were issued in 1536 and seven and, and uh, 1538, which basically address the, the concerns the that were happening. Um, because they're the what the it was is the Dominicans in particular, <laughs> there was a lot of kind of conflict going on between these these different orders. And it was primarily the Dominicans which were complaining that the Franciscans were not properly following the rubrics of baptism. And that's where this whole controversy came about. Um, and that's when this one papal bull came out called Altitudo Divini Concilii came out. And it addressed this this problem that was going on. So, 
So it did happen. It was treated uh, as a problem, the millions of conversions. So <laughs> inadvertently, the Dominicans are actually confirming the numbers by making it, that complaint. Right, exactly. So, <laughs> so just, just to kind of tap uh, top this off, I have actually been in contact with some of these people who, who don't believe the millions of conversions occurred. Mm -hmm. um, and what they're saying is it couldn't possibly be true because what was really going on during that time was population devastation. Uh, recall that this was during the time when millions of indigenous were dying of European diseases, Disease. uh, also from the result of the recent wars that occurred because of the because of the conquest. Also famine. Also famine. Uh, that 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 in order to reach nine to ten million, it it would just be impossible unless, um, unless they were coming from a long distance away. Right, which is what our hypothesis is saying. So um, these people, that you're so th those to, are some. Of, are they are they these anti you know uh, numbers? <laughs> are they Christians? Or are they non? -Christians? Well, I'm curious. Non-Christians. Well, they're primarily non-Christians. Uh, I think, uh, I don't want to mention his name, that, but... That, uh, bias, there was... <laughs> that, that bias could lead into something too, though, you know, their, bi their bias in some particular... Yeah. But, sure, but even so, you're still dealing... We, we still believe that the Guadalupe Flower World Prophecy still addresses that. It doesn't say that the, their, the numbers weren't devastated because the population was devastated. We're simply saying that, well, all the more reason why you would need some another impetus That's to be able thinking. to come up with these numbers. Right away. Right, and, yeah. and that because the, the evidence shows that flower, the flower world concept was so widespread, Spread. it might take into account that m people came from further away than originally thought. And that's how mm -hmm. we could come up with more mm -hmm. people. I mean, if then the uh, conversion accounts themselves you have it documented that people are coming from 200 miles away, 300 miles away, 400 miles away, and more. Hmm. Um, and oftentimes they're speaking different they're languages. They're speaking different languages that the, the Franciscans don't understand, where they're explicitly saying, We don't know where these people came from, but they came in. We never and they're encountered prepared. them. Yeah. As so, far out as they went out to evangelize, they didn't account, they never met these people, groups of people. These other additional groups of people. So you, you see that in the accounts. It's constant. It's constant. We went out into the mountains 50 leagues away, which translates to about 150 miles away. And the people came running out begging for baptism. It doesn't you know, quite make sense. Or we went along, along the Gulf Coast to, to a a village and the entire village, village came, came out begging for baptism. Now, how, how would that be possible if they had no Spanish contact whatsoever? So well, yeah. we're hoping that we're addressing some historical anomalies with our, with our hypothesis. So anyway, what you brought up, that's, that's just one, uh, one anti-apparition.